How many times have you heard or said, what are the odds, as a reaction to a seemingly unlikely event? We then search for an explanation, some meaning to those events, because randomness or just dumb luck doesn't seem to cut it. This may even lead to a belief that numbers themselves hold some
Doctors should see on a regular basis patients who individually may have an extremely rare condition or set of conditions. This all plays into confirmation bias. Uh, again, as I said previously, confirmation bias, which will come up again and again in this course, is a powerful influence on our thinking. Because we can think of, or perhaps we have personally experienced, events that support our beliefs, we take that as confirmation that those beliefs are correct. But that's because we are mining a vast set of personal experiences, a vast set of data, for just those p bits of data that appear to confirm beliefs that we have. This is also part of what I have described as the availability heuristic. Because examples of something are easily available to us, we assume, we feel, as if that phenomenon must therefore be commonplace uh, or representative, when in fact it could just be the quirkiness of our own individual experience. We therefore underestimate the probability of, of events occurring at random. Let me give you a common example that comes up frequently, especially with things like alleged psychics, that of cold reading. Magicians understand that cold reading is a technique. It's a technique that you can use, you can learn. test this hypothesis by systematically evaluating the statements made by alleged psychics to see if they do have quote-unquote hits more often than we would expect from just educated uh, guessing. And when you do that, it turns out that they have many, many more misses and far more misses than the subjects remember. After a reading, the subjects do tend to remember the hits and vastly overestimate the accuracy of the reading. But when it's recorded and counted, there are many more misses than hits. Further, we underestimate how high probability some guesses are. This gets back to the four effect I also described in a previous lecture, where we tend to take vague statements and then apply them in detail or directly to something about our lives or, or our connections. How many people know a woman whose first name begins with the letter M? This may sound like a specific statement, but it's actually a very high probability guess. Or a date that has the number three in it. Sometimes a, a psychic while doing a cold reading will throw out the number three. If they don't initially get a hit, they'll say it could be the day of the month or it could be a number in the month. They will expand it until some connection is made. This is a technique identical to the one used by mentalists or stage magicians who do the same thing for entertainment. Or they might throw as another example.
independent data sets. So that doctor seeing that cluster of patients with the same ailments shouldn't ignore that anecdotal evidence, but he should use it only as a method of generating a hypothesis. Perhaps this is a real pattern. All he could really say is that there is an apparent pattern here and recognize that apparent patterns are going to crop up all the time by random clustering alone. Then he then has to ask, well, if this is a real pattern, it should, we should see it in an independent data set. The, the hypothesis then needs to be tested in a more rigorous or systematic way. A fun example of this pattern searching through uh, large sets of data or a data mining exercise is a, a book that was published called The Bible Code. What the authors did was look for hidden codes in the Bible, although you can do this with any large book, any book really, by stringing together disconnected letters. They used a computer algorithm to look for patterns of letters spaced out in the Bible. And then they were amazed to find phrases appear that these, these disconnected letters could be put together in a pattern, a pattern of words and phrases that they then further pattern matched to uh, events in world history. Now, this, this practice underestimates the probability that some pattern would be found at by random chance alone. And it also grossly underestimates the human ability to find meaningful patterns in randomness. Uh, for example, these random phrases were then matched to all of world history, and you, of course you can find something that will seem to fit. And, but again, our intuition is once we seem to uh, see the fit, it seems very compelling to us. Here's a funny example of just this. Psalm 46 of the King James Bible, published in the 46th year of William Shakespeare's life. The 46th word is shake, and the 46th word from the end is spear. What are the odds of that occurring? Well, of course, it's vanishingly small. But we really have to ask, what are the odds of some weird coincidence happening? And since there are so many potential coincidences that could happen, the answer is, over time, it is certain that very low probability coincidence, like the Shakespeare one I just described, will happen The subject guessed greater than chance the card that the target was looking at. Now they hypothesize that, well, maybe psychic ability needs a warm-up period. And then maybe further the psychic ability will tire out. So after a while, the researcher, uh, the, the, uh, this, the alleged psychic who was, being, um, who was being tested, their ability would wear off or would, would turn off. So that, that, this is what led to optional starting and stopping. They would uh, look for a string of, of hits in the, the series of data. They would discard everything before that as the warm-up period. They would discard the data after that as the, uh, the, the, the ability wearing off. And they would just count the string of excess positives. But this was a way of mining a larger data set for a random cluster of hits. If you look at the entire data set, there is no excess of hits. If there really were a string of psychic guesses in the middle of random guessing, there would still be an excess of hits to misses. 
you know, greater than probability alone, but there wasn't. And that pretty much killed the hypothesis of optional starting and stopping. Again, it is a, a very telling historical example of using data mining in bad research. Nostradamus is another classic example of retrofitting, of looking after the fact for some kind of pattern recognition as a way of mining inadvertently a large data set. Nostradamus was famous for his quatrains, most of which are vague, poetic predictions. Uh, these are come from the first century. He, he, for here is an example of one. A coffin is put into the vault of iron, where seven children of the king are held. The ancestors and forebears will come forth from the depths of hell, lamenting to see, thus dead, the fruit of their line. Now that sounds very poetic. It may sound very profound. installations in the night sky and assigned patterns meaningful to their culture, to their time in history, to those patterns. This is what mathematicians call the clustering illusion. We have a poor naive sense of the degree to which randomness clusters. To give another example, diseases tend to cluster. They are not evenly distributed throughout society, they're randomly distributed. The Center for Disease Control and other organizations whose job it is to track diseases, like cancer for example, will find that there are clusters that crop up from time to time. After investigation, they determine that most such reported cl clusters are statistical flukes, not a real effect. It is simply the clustering effect of randomness. But people who experience the cluster have a strong belief, a powerful belief that they must be real. If you have an uncommon disease and your next door neighbor gets the same uncommon disease, like leukemia for example, it's very difficult to shake the sense that that can't be a coincidence. Something must be going on. That is, how we are hardwired to feel that, that that must be the case but only objective, thorough, rigorous, systematic analysis can really tell you if this is just a random cluster or a real effect out there in the world. Let me give you a more common example, that from sports. Now, many people watch sports 
or, or play sports, and we develop a lot of statistically based uh, biases and false assumptions based upon that. There is, uh, for example, a belief in the hot hands effect. In basketball, for example, we believe that when a shooter is, uh, a basketball shooter is doing well, he's made a few baskets, that he's on a streak. He is more likely to make more baskets. However, when statistically an, uh, analyzed, the, the, there's a clear answer to this, and that answer is no. There is no real effect of hot hands. Shooting streaks in professional basketball tend to follow a random pattern. If players had hot and cold streaks, real hot and cold streaks, an effect other than randomness, there would be more and longer streaks than is predicted by randomness alone. But when large sets of data are looked at uh, rigorously, we find that there just isn't these longer streaks. The amount of streakiness that we see in making and missing baskets is exactly what we would predict by randomness alone. Yet the belief in the hot hands effect among players and fans is very hard to shake. I've had this experience myself where I've tried very uh, emphatically to explain to a basketball fan that there is no hot hands effect. Even when they eventually understand the statistics, they cannot bring themselves to believe that there is no effect there. Something must be going on. And they also fall prey to the availability heuristic in that they can easily reach for explanations for the effect. Players are confident, and that confidence makes them perform better. Of course, when they miss, that's because they were overconfident. They, when they're missing, then they get, they get shaken. They are, they are now, their confidence is down, and therefore they're more likely to make a mistake. However, you can use the opposite reasoning. When they've missed a few ba baskets in a row, you might say, well, they're due. They're due to make a basket. Or when they've made a few baskets in a row, they're due to miss one. So we can use this contradictory reasoning to explain anything that happens. But our, our, in, our intuition is to apply some meaning to what is statistically proven to be a random sequence of events. This crops up frequently in gambling as well. Gambling is, in fact, a giant exercise in probability. And casinos count on the fact that people are terrible at probability. There is, in fact, a fallacy called the gambler's fallacy. If you just flipped a fair coin uh, heads 10 times in a row, what is the chance of, the, of flipping heads on the next toss? Our intuition often tells us, well, it's probably less than 50-50. If you just flipped heads 10 times in a row, then tails is due. Um, or you may alternately think that, well, you're on a streak of heads, so the chance is increased. Again, you can
Oh. Um, therefore, players doing statistically above their average are likely to regress to their average performance. However, this doesn't feel like the answer to us, so we invent all kinds of magical thinking to explain this illusory effect of just randomness. For example, there is something called the Sports Illustrated Curse. After a player gets on the cover of Sports Illustrated for having an above average performance year, they will then falter. They will then have a bad year following the year they had that got them on the cover. But regression to the mean alone explains, explains that occurrence. We don't need to hypothesize that the player got cocky or sloppy, or perhaps they were distracted by all the media attention. Having an above average year, you're almost guaranteed by regression to the mean in order to have a more average year following that. Knowledge of mathematics and probability are critical for making sense of the world. And in many ways, we live in a mathematical universe. It is the language of explaining how things work. But we have to simultaneously recognize how terrible we are at doing so naively. We did not evolve to have a really highly developed 